Good morning, Temecula Hills. Good morning, church family. It's good to see you all on this beautiful Sunday. We're going to start our worship service off with a couple songs of praise. So for those of you who are in the back still yet to find your seat, I invite you to come on up. For those of you who are seated, I invite you to stand uh, as we honor our God in singing. I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, a passage beloved by all. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We celebrate the God who saves us, the God who was and is and is to come, and for all the great things he has done. So we're going to start uh, singing, contemplating that. Please sing with us.
there are no words we could speak to capture the depth of your being. With Jesus, there's no God. Well, welcome children. It's so fun to have a full house with the kids. If you have not picked up one of these inserts, there's some in the back for your kids to be able to color. But don't color yet, kids. You will get instructions later. Um, Dave, I have a question. Yes. You're a history guy. I think something in 1928 might have happened. 1928. Lots of things happened in 1928. Yeah. Bubble gum was invented in 1928. Oh. Penicillin was not invented, but found, discovered. Thank you, doctor. Um, Hoover, 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 Hoover won the presidency. And, uh, oh, Steamboat Willie. It wasn't his first film, but a third one with sound. But none of those compare to the birthday of Margot 96 years ago. So happy, happy birthday. I think the birthday song is one of the most painful songs because it's too slow, so I'm going to solo it for you real quick, if you'd like. This is your birthday song. It isn't very long. Happy birthday. Woo! Well, again, good morning, everyone. If everyone wants to say good morning and shake a hand to a child or an adult near you, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Good morning. Good morning. Wait, you can let him know. <laughs> Only that. Just this. Just this picture. Yes. Yeah. This is easier to get. All right, I have received further instruction. Children, you can draw and write on this side, just don't color the picture yet. So you can play around with this side, just not this side. Okay. For today, uh, if you saw in our email, there's an inner outreach ministry meeting happening today after service. So this is a ministry for those of you who have a heart for, want to walk alongside those who might be new to our church family or those who are already a part of our church family but are just struggling to get plugged in. So there's a meeting today right after service. We'll be meeting in the front corner of church right there. And you can ask Lucas any questions you have. Oh, and I'm doing the next one. Women's Friday morning summer study is starting this Friday. So if you have not signed up for it yet, you can still join. It's a 40-minute study in a book called Ignite Your Passion for God. And we all need that daily uh, reigniting of our faith. And so that's happening from 9.15 to 10.30 upstairs. And the book cost is $9. If you do need babysitting, let us know that is available, but we need to know that you need a babysitter. So you can contact Marianne with any questions. We are not having a men's breakfast this July, but that, oh wait, who booed? Who booed? Who was it? Okay, then you need to be here because you can still come on that July the 20th because we've been doing some uh, renovations, remodel upstairs, we want to get another classroom going. Dylan Hoover and some other guys have been working on that last couple weeks, but we need some painters. So men's breakfast, not here, but painting breakfast, donut slash Lucas is in charge now of that. That's fantastic. So women, you're, you're welcome to come as well, but we just need to get that painted so that we can put the carpet in afterwards, um, some tile. So if you'd like to come on that uh, Saturday instead to do that, uh, much appreciated. Talk to Dylan, uh, who's been leading that project, and it sounds like Lucas now as well. Um, <laughs> baptism. So... I used to always give my dad a hard time. He was raised in a Roman Catholic church before he became a believer in his 20s. And I was baptized when I was a, a child, infant. Um, and it wasn't until my mid-30s, I think, until I realized that baptism is when you recognize who Jesus is and he's the Lord of your life. And so I took that step of obedience and was baptized mid-30s. And um, my dad was not baptized. And I said, Dad, you know, I said, you're my dad, so I can be respectful, but you're also my brother in Christ and you're in direct disobedience. And so, um, you know, we'd go back and forth, back and forth. So recently, I just uh, visited my dad in Texas uh, a couple months ago, and that came up again. I said, Dad, have you been baptized yet? You know, because you're still in disobedience. Because how often do you get to tell your dad he's in disobedience um, without being respectful? And so uh, he, he's like, David, why don't you go on my desk? And there's something there. I'm like, oh, okay. So I went to the desk, and that's kind of corny, but whatever. They have a little certificate of baptism that the church gives him. So my dad was 81 years old when he got baptized. So, if my dad can be in obedience, so can the, those of us that were not baptized after we uh, claimed that we knew who Jesus Christ was. So, if you have not been baptized and you want to know what that means, then I would encourage you to talk to Nathaniel, one of the elders. But we will have that opportunity um, on July the 28th to have a baptism here in the service. So, any questions about that, reach out to the church office or one of the elders. And I would encourage you to take that step of outward expression that I am a follower of Jesus Christ and that I want to let people know that to be baptized. Um, this is going to be our Sunday where we collect a benevolence offering, so we're going to have our ushers come up here. Um, that benevolence offering is for those that might be in need, for basic needs. If you're a guest with us, we never want your money. We're just glad you're here. Um, there's a contact card in your bulletin, and if you have questions about our church or we can be praying for you, um, please fill that out. I, I am not as faithful as I need to be when it comes to praying, but as I was driving here to, wor uh, to work, to church this morning, um, I began to just pray and just ask some things. We have some people in our home group that are traveling. We have some other people in our home group that broke some ribs and have some serious health concerns. And we were just praying about those people and just letting them know that we're thinking about them. And I thought for a second, like, I actually have the opportunity right now to talk to the creator of the universe. And I thought to myself, I can't get a hold of President Biden 
I can't get a hold of my, my representative of Congress. I can't get a hold of a senator. I, I bet you I couldn't even get a return call from my mayor. But yet I have the opportunity to talk to the Lord, and he listens to me. And that is incredible. So this morning when we're uh, getting ready for communion and we see this cross, a lot of us have different stories at first, but they all end up being the same. And that is because of what he did on this cross, we can remember him today during communion, and we can talk to the creator of the universe. So let's be reminded of what a great privilege that is. So let's pray and continue our time this morning. Lord, it is a privilege to talk to the creator of the universe, to the one that has always been and will always be. And it is a privilege to have the Holy Spirit as a helper here today. And it is a privilege to remember what your son did on the cross so willingly for a sinner like me who has been redeemed through the blood of my Savior. So, Lord, I pray that we remember the importance of prayer and that we pray for one another and that we pray for our lost children and we pray for those that are sick and we praise the Lord for what he's doing and will do. For those that are traveling this, this week and through the month of summers, I just pray, Lord, that you protect them. For those that are dealing with health issues, I pray, Lord, that you will miraculously heal them, give the doctors wisdom, but most importantly, have them wait upon you and know that you are fully controlled regardless of those answers. We love you, Lord, and we are so thankful to gather this morning and proclaim that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and that you are returning to take us home. And in Jesus' precious name, amen. Spirit is within me because 
remain standing for the reading of the word. Thank you, worship team. That was beautiful. Okay, our reading this morning is Deuteronomy 6.4. Uh, that might be familiar to you. As soon as I start reading, you'll recognize it. Uh, it's the famous, the Shema, the heartbeat profession of faith in Judaism. So I have to take a moment real quick and tell you guys, this is pretty cool. I wasn't supposed to be the reader this morning. I got called on last minute. What am I reading? The Shema. This is pretty cool. That's the second time in my life something like this happened. I used to be in D.C. I was in the Navy. God was calling me to Jewish ministry. And it was a big step of faith to leave the Navy and to see where this calling would lead. And before I, I took this step of faith, I went with four guys from my church to the Bible reading marathon on the steps of the Capitol in D.C. where you read scripture, publicly proclaimed scripture, 96 hours continuously. We signed up for four 15-minute slots. I got in for my 15-minute slot, and this was the passage I had. 15 minutes out of 96 hours, I did the math, and if I did it right, it's .002% that I had to, to get that scripture. So. I'm blessed to read this passage again this morning. So if you have your Bibles, follow along with me. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Do we have children in here today? You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Let's pray. Abba Father, we thank you for gathering us this morning. Thank you, Lord, that the kids and families can all be here together this morning, Lord. Our hearts are open uh, to hear from you through Pastor Nathaniel, Lord. Our, our attention is on him as he comes, Lord. Would you use him to speak to us from your word, to encourage us, to challenge us, to minister to us. We are ready to hear from you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. good morning. We are well into summer, aren't we? It is warm out. I hope you're having a good summer so far. Today, after church, uh, our family is headed to Yosemite to go camping. And uh, 
when d- in doing that, we're really carrying on a family tradition. Every single summer growing up, my family would go to Yosemite and go camping. And before I was born, every summer, my mom's family would go to Yosemite and go camping. And before that, my grandpa and his family would go camping in Yosemite. So I have little pictures of my grandpa as a two-year-old in Yosemite camping. And so it's been a family tradition for us. And I have so many good memories that we form there. Um, I remember sitting around the campfire, staying up late, making, uh, roasting marshmallows, telling bear stories. I remember my grandma freaking out whenever we went on a hike because I was walking too close to the edge and grandma telling my mom, Brenda, he's walking too close to the edge. And I remember making my first hiking stick with my first pocket knife. Um, I remember my grandma telling my grandpa where to set up their tent and him fully assembling it and then my grandma deciding it needed to be moved about four feet. And so him patiently taking the entire tent down and re-putting it up again. Um, I remember floating down the river in little rapids we made out of rocks. And I remember driving in the car with a never-ending Neil Young cassette tape playing on repeat and pleading with my dad to put something else on. But that was the only cassette tape in the car. So... Now I know every song by heart. But one thing you constantly deal with when you go on vacation is the battle for the family crown. And I'm not talking about a fun board game everyone plays. Instead, I'm talking about the persistent battle of who's in charge, who's going to get their way, who gets to decide what we listen to on the drive. Who gets to choose what we're going to do next? Who gets to float down the river first? Who's causing us to be late? And who's pressuring everybody to be on time? Who's going to appreciate me for this vacation I am providing all these ungrateful people? (laughs) And how will I respond when things don't go my way? That's the question. Who's wearing the family crown? And this comes out particularly on vacation, but really it's an important question for everyday life. In the regular ins and outs of everyday life, we should be asking, who's in charge today? And as Christians, we know that Jesus is ultimately the one in charge. And so our questions should be, how can we as a family put the crown on Jesus so that he's in charge and he gets his way? How can our family live on mission so that this world sees how great it is to live under his reign of love? How can our family live with Jesus as our king? Well, today we're kicking off a four-week topical series called God's Faithful Family, where we're going to unpack how, as a family, we can honor God. How can we be faithful to him first and foremost? And together, we're a church family, but we're also made up of a lot of individual families. So we're a family of families. And that can look very different for each of us. Some of us have big families, some small families, some married with no kids, some of us have kids, some have experienced the messy pain of divorce, some have kids at home still, some have grown kids, some are grandparents, some want to be grandparents. Some are single, and, but for each of us, God has a design and a plan and a purpose for how we are to function as families and for his kingdom. And that's what we're going to talk about throughout this series. This week, we're going to introduce God's heart for the family and look at how our families can show the world how great it is to live under his reign of love. Next week, we're going to look at being a word-centered family. The week after that, we're going to consider how we can be a family that's on mission for Jesus. And in the final week, we're going to consider God's calling for each of our different family relationships. And kids, we are so excited that you're here with us. You're going to be joining us for these next four weeks um, throughout July. And then in August, your classes will start up again. But there is a fun bulletin you can get out now. And I want to encourage you to use that and follow along, take notes. There's places to to answer questions and 
fill things in. There's even those, that little coloring picture that you can draw. And I, what I want you to do is at each of my points, there's going to be one of those pictures you can color in. So wait until you see the picture on the screen. And when you see it on the screen, then color it in. Okay? Got it? All right. So today we're going to see four truths about the family. And each of these four truths will build to help us see how we can make God central in our families. And every time I share one of those truths, that's when you color the picture. Okay, well, if you're not already there, open your Bibles up to Genesis 3. If you're a kid and you're having a hard time finding passages in Scripture, that's okay, because Genesis is just page one. And flip over a couple pages until you see the big three. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3. And the first point we're going to see this morning, the first truth, is every family struggles because each of us tries to rule over our own lives. So kids, now it's time to color that little picture of the family. Because in the beginning, God created a family. God created Adam, and from Adam, God created Eve. And they were created needing each other, each complementing the other perfectly. Adam filled the role of a wise and kind leader. And Eve functioned as a nurturing, relational helper. And they lived in complete harmony with God, with one another, with the rest of creation. And life was truly beautiful because they lived with God as their king, just as things were supposed to be. God was their king. He was reigning over them. He reigned over their hearts, so they loved the things he loved. He reigned over their minds, so they thought the way he thought. He reigned over their actions, so they did the things he told them to. He, they obeyed his word. They listened to his voice. They walked with him. They had relationship with him. God was their friend and their king, and life was beautiful. Everyone was blessed. Everyone was happy. But as every single one of us knows, that is not how things are today. So what happened? Well, Genesis 3 tells us. And what it tells us is this. Look at verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may not tree eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat. We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So what we see happening here is something very, very sad. Adam and Eve were deceived by the serpent, and that serpent was Satan, appearing to them as a snake. And God did not create Adam and Eve as robots. God gave them free will and a choice to obey him as the first family, and they chose to not trust God, to not have God be their king. And so they took the crown off of God, and they chose to trust themselves and put the crown on themselves as their own kings. My phone is ringing. If everybody wants to silence their cell phones, it's probably a good time to do that. If you're trying to get a hold of me, now is not the best time to chat. <laughs> All right. Now, the first thing I want you to see here, I want to look at what Satan did, because he's still doing these same things today. The very first thing we see here is that he questioned God's word. Look at that in verse 1. See that? It says, Now the serpent was more crafty 
than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat from any of the tree of the garden? Did God actually say? It was questioning God's word, stirring up doubt, stirring up thoughts, questioning God's authority. It wasn't all at once. This was a slow stir, a slow removal of God's crown. The second thing he did was cause God's word to be distorted. You see it there in verse 3? It says, but God, when, when Eve is talking, she says, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree of gar- that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it. God never said not to touch it. This was a distortion of God's word. And Satan still likes to confuse God's word, adding things to it, taking things away from it, making it seem irrelevant. But the Bible is clear, and we need to listen to it firmly, listen to what it actually says. The next thing we see is that Satan denied God's word. And when he denied God's word, he questioned God's character, God's heart for his people. You see it in verse 4? It says, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He made people, these people think that God's way was not the best way. And so they didn't trust God. And what was happening is people were taking the crown off of God's head and putting it on their own heads. And there's one more thing we see Satan do here. One more thing. See, Satan reversed the roles that God had established in relationships. See, God made Adam first. Because Adam was to have the role of leader in the relationship. And God made Eve second because she was to be Adam's helper. And God gave Adam instructions about the tree. And Adam was to give those instructions to Eve because he was the leader. And what Satan did is reverse this order. He came to Eve instead of Adam. And look at verse 6 to see this. It says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. You see that? Adam was there. But the whole time, Satan was talking to Eve. And instead of Adam being a kind and wise, protective leader of his family... The order gets reversed here, and Eve takes the lead. And as a result, the whole family is led into sin. And they take the crown off of God. And each tries to put it on themselves. And what we see happening throughout the Bible is people fight over being king. And then they use that kingship, they use their authority in bad ways. And this is a great reminder for families, because God has established an order in the family. The husband is the head of the home. They're called to be a wise and kind sacrificial leader. Wives are called to lovingly submit to their husbands, which means they still help influence and guide their husbands because husbands need their wives. But they also lovingly affirm the leadership of husbands. Now, in this order, we also find that children are to come under the leadership of both the husband and the wife under the leadership of their mom and their dad. And so children are commanded to honor their father and mother, to obey them. Now, because of sin, this order gets all messed up. Everyone's fighting over the crown. And so husbands take the crown. And instead of being kind leaders, husbands become either passive pushovers who don't lead at all, or domineering bullies who lead in anger. And instead of being nurturing relational helpers, wives can become bossy control freaks or passive-aggressive manipulators. And when children try to wear the crown, they make foolish choices that hurt them and their families, and they act as if they are the center of the universe, and everything is about them. From this point on, every single family was messed up. Every family is messy. 
Sometimes we think our family is unique. Only our family has those hidden, ugly secrets that nobody knows about. But everybody else, we, we think, we sit there and we think, everybody else's family is just Instagram perfect. They're always happy. No one argues. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. We all have ugly closets. We all struggle because we've all rebelled against God. We've chosen to do things our way instead of God's way, every single one of us. And when we've done that, what we're saying is, God, you're not the king of my life. I'm the king. I'm going to wear the crown. Or sometimes we even put the crown on other things. We worship false things as though they were God. Maybe we worship our money or our toys or our stuff or a relationship or something else. See, the main problem of humans, the main problem of the entire Bible is that God is not our king. He's not reigning over our hearts. He's not ruling us. Instead, we try to reign over our lives. We try to be king. Or we try to make something else king. So what is the answer to this problem? Well, God begins answering this problem in the Old Testament, and then he gives us a full answer in the New Testament. So we're going to start by seeing the beginning of God's answer in the Old Testament, and it's all about God's word. See, the story starts when God calls Abraham. And from Abraham, God creates a nation called Israel. And he, Israel fell into slavery in Egypt, and God delivered slavery when he parted the sea at the Exodus. And then God led Israel to a mountain where he began giving them his word. And in his word, God was showing Israel what it looked like for them to make God king over their lives, over their families again. He was showing them what it looked like to let him be the main thing, letting him reign in their hearts and lives. And what we're going to see, our next point is this. Our family can make God our king by knowing and obeying his word. By knowing and obeying his word. So part of making God king is letting his word rule over our lives. Kids, you can color that Bible now. And so to, to, to symbolize that, I'm going to take the crown and I'm going to put it on this Bible. We'll see if it stays there. Okay. If it doesn't, it's a good, it, it's a good symbolism too. All right. So do you flip over to Deuteronomy 6.4 that Joseph read for us, and we'll read that again. Deuteronomy 6.4. If you're in Genesis, you just flip to the right. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. And as Joseph said, this is the central Bible, the central passage to the people of Israel. Um, so let me read to you, beginning in Genesis 6, 4. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes." You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Okay, it starts, this is called the Shema, because the Hebrew word for hear is Shema. And it starts by saying, hear. It's saying, hear, O Israel, listen to what I'm about to say to you. And then it's followed by a fierce declaration that God and only God is our king. He's our God and he reigns over us. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Since God is our king, he is to rule over us so that we love him with our hearts, with our soul, with our whole lives, with all our might, with our strength. It's all to be under his reign. 
But how do we live like this? How do we grow to be a family that lives like this? Well, the next verses start to tell us, and it's about knowing God's word as our authority. Look at verse 6. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. It says these word, God's word is to be on our heart. That means we know it deep inside of us, becomes part of us, part of what governs us. And to do that, we need to chew on God's word. We have to think about it and consider it. Imagine your favorite food. Maybe a juicy steak or a giant burger or a huge piece of pizza. And now imagine you tried to eat that food by swallowing it whole without chewing it. What would happen? Would you enjoy it? No, you'd choke You'd feel sick. You might even throw up if you could get it down. Why? Because for it to nourish you, for it to feed you, you have to chew on it. And the same thing is true with God's Word. We don't just read God's Word and then dismiss it if it doesn't immediately help us in that very moment. No, we think about it. We chew on it. We consider it. We look at the context. We look at other passages that talk about the same thing. We ponder it. In Psalm 1, it says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. We need to chew on God's word so that we can digest it and get it deep into our hearts. But there's more we can do as a family to make this happen. Look at verse 7. It says, And you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. Parents, we are to teach God's word diligently to our children. That's part of our calling, part of our duty as parents. We don't just take them to church and hope they'll get it all there. We're central to their spiritual education. We should be intentionally imparting God's word to our kids, teaching them diligently. And we don't do that like a formal classroom, but rather we do it in the classroom of everyday life. You see it there? It says, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise, when you're sitting in your house, maybe eating dinner together, you talk about God's word. You talk about what you've been reading in the Bible. When you walk by the way, maybe in today's world, when you're driving from one place to another, you talk about the Bible. You don't have to listen to Neil Young all the time. You can talk about the Bible. You talk about what you've been reading recently. When you lie down, when you rise, all the time, all throughout your day, you can intentionally discuss God's word. And so when a question arises, instead of going to Google, you ask, well, what would the Bible say about that? So kids, when you're hanging out at home, ask your parents to read you Bible stories. And then use your imagination to think about what those stories would really be like. And parents... Let's find ways to incorporate the Bible into everyday discussion. The Bible should have a central role in our family life, not just our church life. So let me ask you, in your home, does the Bible have this role? And how could you be intentional about giving it a more central role? This passage continues to talk about how we can remind ourselves that the Bible is our authority. Look at verse 8. It says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You know, Jews historically have taken this quite literally, even wearing little boxes on their hands or their foreheads with scripture in them, or posting a mezuzah, a little little box uh, with scripture at the door of their home. Um, But I think this is a reminder that we keep God's word ever before us as our authority. God's word is the authority of what we do with our hands. 
It's the authority over our eyes, over what we allow into our mind through our eyes. What thoughts do we allow into our minds? And it's the authority over our homes. That's why it's on the doorposts and, and the gates. So dads, let me ask you, is God's word the authority over what you allow into your home? Does it govern what your kids watch? Are you protecting your family from watching things that are outright evil or watching things without being discerning about them? Kids, if you see something you know is wrong in a TV show or a movie, do you turn it off and go tell your parents? That's part of letting God's word be our authority, of letting God reign as king. So in the Old Testament, we see that our family can make God king by knowing and obeying God's word. Now, when we come to the New Testament, we get even a fuller picture. And what we're going to see is this. Our family can make God our king by surrendering our lives to follow Jesus. By surrendering our lives to follow Jesus. All right, time to color those footprints, kids. Now, when Jesus came, he came preaching one central message. And if you want to see it, flip in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to see it. Mark 1, 14. What was the central message Jesus preached? Well, it says in Mark 1, 14, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. This says Jesus was proclaiming the gospel of God. And gospel just means good news. So what was the good news of God that Jesus was proclaiming? Well, what's the verse say? It says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. That means the kingdom of God is almost here. God's rule, God's reign as king is coming. And it was coming in Jesus himself because Jesus is God in the flesh. And so Jesus is God who stepped down from the glory of heaven to the lowliness of earth. And the central message of Jesus is, I have come so God can be king once again. But how did Jesus invite people to make God their king? Look at the next verse, verse 16. It says, Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Jesus invited people to follow him, and they left everything to follow him. Jesus is saying, live like me, follow me, live in relationship with me, and God will become your king. See, God's kingdom was coming through Jesus himself. And so you can ask yourself, what would Jesus do in this situation? How would Jesus act? How can I make Jesus my king? And so Jesus Following Jesus as king. I'm going to put this crown up here now to remind us that we follow Jesus to make God our king. If you want to God to reign as king, it means getting to know Jesus and following Jesus. Now, to explain what this, how this works and what this means, I want to share about one of Jesus' parables that he shared once. In a parable, it's just a story that contains a deeper truth. And this one is very simple. It's just one verse. Matthew 13, 44. It says this. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. How many of you have ever thought it would be really cool to find hidden treasure? I have. When I went to Israel, I was looking all over for it. Um, maybe you've seen Treasure Island or Treasure Buddies or the Goonies or National Treasure or Indiana Jones or Pirates of the Caribbean. Maybe you've thought, oh man, I wish I could find hidden treasure. Okay, well imagine today you're driving home from church and while you're driving, you, you come by, you drive by a big empty field 
and you see something shiny in that big field. And so you ask your parents to pull over, and they pull over, you get out to check it out, and as you uncover it, you find a gold coin. And then you find another one, and another one, and another one, and then you realize you have found the lost gold of the Temecula Pirates. <laughs> it's been missing for over 100 years, and you just found it. But because it's in a field that doesn't belong to you, it's not yours. But then you look up and you see a big for sale sign on that field. And so what do you do? Well, you bury all those gold coins again and you go home and you call the number on the for sale sign and you ask if you can buy the field. But they say, they say yeah, you can buy it, but there's just one problem. It's gonna cost you everything you have. Your parents are gonna have to sell all their stuff their house, their car, their TV, everything except the clothes they're wearing, all their stuff. And they also have to sell all your stuff, all your toys, everything you have. You have to sell it all. But you're so excited and you're so joyful to sell it because you know that that field is way more valuable than all your stuff. Because under that field is buried treasure. Let me ask you a question. Would you be excited or sad to get rid of all your stuff? Excited, right? Because you found a priceless treasure. It's worth way more than all your old stuff. And Jesus says that's what God's kingdom is like. That's what it's like to surrender your life so God can be your king. It means you may have to give something up. You have to give up something that maybe even you think is going to make you happy. But making God your king is priceless. It's the best thing you can do. It's the treasure hidden in the field. Having him reign over your life, over your heart, there's no better way to live. But to let him reign over your life means you have to surrender to him. It means you say, God, you're in charge. God, I'm going to treat my parents how you want me to treat them because you're in charge. You're my king. God, I'm going to love my wife sacrificially because you're my king. God, I'm going to submit to my husband even though I don't feel like it because you're my king. So Jesus calls us to surrender everything to him and confess, I'm not king, Jesus. You're king. You're the one in charge now. You're wearing the crown. So for husbands, that means they say, I'm not king. Jesus is king. So I can't lead my family like a bully. I can't lead my family like a passive pushover who's never present. I have to lead my family with love and kindness and courage and strength like Jesus. I have to nurture my family with God's word so that God reigns over them, so that people can see how great it is to live under God's reign as king. For wives, it means they say, I'm not king. Jesus is king. So I can't control my family. Instead, I have to recognize Jesus' control and Jesus' authority over my family. I have to trust him as, my, as I affirm my husband's leadership. I have to encourage my family to relate rightly to God and to each other. I have to be a true helper to my husband so that our family has right relationships and they can all see how great it is to live under God's reign. For kids, this means they say, I'm not the king, Jesus is king. Jesus gave me parents to love me and guide me and help me. And Jesus made my parents my authority. So I have to trust them and love them and honor them and obey them. And I have to obey them even when I don't like what they say. Even when they make me clean my room. Even when I'm feeling tired and grumpy. Even when I feel like it's not fair. I have to obey them to show the world how great it is to live under God's reign. Let me encourage you. Your family can show how great it is to live under God's reign of love. Your family can display the goodness of God being your king. And so that people look at your family and the first thing they think is not, wow, their house is so clean. And it's not, wow, they have so much money and such fun toys and such nice cars and such great vacations. Wow, those kids are so well-behaved and so smart and so well-homeschooled or Wow, they take such cute family pictures. No, instead, the first thing they say is, wow, they live under God's reign. Wow, God really is their king. 
Is that the priority in your family? The crown on me? Or is the crown on him? Are you making little day-by-day decisions to make God the king of your life, the king of your home? Within the role you have in your family, are you choosing to live in integrity, following God's way, even when no one is watching? Choosing to trust his word and know his word and make his word what rules your life? Are you choosing day by day to live in rightly ordered relationships in your home? Sometimes as a family, I know it feels like our choices are not making a difference. But Jesus once told a parable about God's kingdom, about how it grows in ways you can't see. It says it in this in Matthew 13, 31. He put another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. See, God's kingdom often grows in ways that are invisible. It's a seed planted. It's leaven mixed into the dough. It's hidden, but it's quietly growing. And one day, you'll see the fruit, as you see God has done far beyond all you ask, could have asked or imagined. Your family can show how great it is to live under God's reign of love. And as we close our message today, we need to do so by remembering what Jesus did so that God could be our king. And what we're going to remember is this. Our family can make God our king because Jesus gave up his glory to bear our punishment on the cross. Now, we all know that none of us lives perfectly. None of us perfectly does what we're called to do as part of the family. We all fail. We all sin. In fact, if there was a perfect family, if you joined it, it would instantly be imperfect. Every single one of us fails to be a perfect family member, and that's why Jesus came. Jesus came, and let me ask you, was Jesus rich? Did he have a lot of gold and money and the best clothes? No. In 2 Corinthians 8, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Did Jesus live in a massive palace? Did he live in a massive palace? No. In fact, in Matthew 8, it says, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Did Jesus have cooks and butlers and maids and servants who waited on him? No. In fact, it says, Matthew 28, 20, 28, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And let me ask one more question about Jesus. Did Jesus wear a king's crown? He did wear a crown, but it wasn't a crown that honored him as king. Let me read to you from Matthew 27. It says, And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, And they put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him, and took a reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, and they stripped him of the robe, they put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. You see, because we have rebelled against God, we deserve God's wrath. But God loved us so much that instead of punishing us, he sent Jesus And Jesus bore our punishment. He went to the cross and he took our sin. All the bad things we've done were put on Jesus. And God punished Jesus for our sin. So he didn't wear the crown of glory that he deserved. Instead, for you and me, he wore a crown of thorns. Let me switch this out. You and I deserve that. A crown of thorns squished into his skull, tearing his skin and making him bleed. 
That's what we deserve, but Jesus bore it for us. And he bore it for us so that we could make God our king. And now our family can show that when we do mess up, we have forgiveness. We have grace. We can forgive and love one another like Jesus, because of Jesus. So our family's messiness shows our need of a Savior and can point to the grace of Jesus and show where the crown of our family, our family crown really sits. Every family struggles because each of us tries to rule over our own lives. But our family can make God our king by knowing and obeying his word and surrendering our lives to follow Jesus as king. And our family can make Jesus king because Jesus gave up his glory to bear our punishment on the cross. Although he deserved the highest crown, he bore the crown of thorns to give us grace and forgiveness. So as we close our service, we're going to do as we do on the first Sunday of every month. We're going to take communion to remember that Jesus died for us. And communion is only for those who have really and fully put their trust in Jesus. I remember one time taking communion at church, and one of my kids wanted to take communion um, because they wanted grape juice, but I, I uh, didn't think they totally understood the gospel uh, at their age where they had actually trusted in Jesus. And so um, I whispered to him to just let it pass by. And after a, a few moments later, he said, but why? I want to take communion. And so we stepped outside together, and I asked him a few questions, and then he prayed in his own words to make Jesus his king and to ask Jesus to pay for his sins. And then he came back inside and took communion with us. And so if you want to do that today, you can do that. And parents, we'll let you use your discretion with the kids. Kids, you can trust your parents. Trust what they're thinking, okay? So the ushers and the worship team are going to come forward, and then we'll pass out the bread and the juice, and we'll hold on to it, and then I'll come back up and we'll all take it together after this song. But what we're going to be doing is eating a piece of bread that represents Jesus' body that was broken for us on the cross. And then we're going to drink the juice that represents Jesus' blood that was spilled out for us on the cross. We're remembering the price he paid so that we could be forgiven, so that God could be our king. So let's pray, and then we'll take communion in a moment. Lord Jesus, we admit fully that even this week, Lord, there have been ways that we have said we want to be king, and we've taken the crown and put it on ourselves. And thank you so much that, Lord, you forgive us, and you show us grace, and you went to the cross to pay for our sins. And Lord, now as we remember what you've done for us, Lord, I pray that you would just help us to have open hearts fully confessed of sin, Lord, fully open to you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us now to remember you uh, in our hearts. Thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. We come that you 
mighty one with one desire we come that you In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-three, 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we look forward to the day that you come back. And Lord, thank you so much that you took our place on the cross. You bore all our sin, all our shame, all our guilt, so that we could stand righteous and free before you. Thank you for restoring us to relationship with God. Help us, Lord, to live with you as our king this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all song. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe.
Amen. Thank you, worship team. Um, a couple quick notes. There is a meeting in this corner at right after church for our inner outreach team. Uh, so if you're interested in being part of the inner outreach team, head over there. If you don't know what it is and you're really curious, that's cool. Head over there too. Lucas will be there and you can chat with him. If you need prayer, we'll have a prayer team meeting over at the defibrillator over there. And uh, there's coffee and refreshments. Have a great day.